The internet can be a strange place when it comes to performance cars. It often feels like it's full of miserable people who want to suck every little bit of pride and joy out of owning anything that isn't a 911 GT3 or a Toyota Yaris that's had a load of Viagra. Take this, for example. It is the Ferrari 355 Spider, and according to people on the internet, it's the least desirable Ferrari you could buy. <laughs> For a start, the steering wheel's on the wrong side for the UK. Secondly, it's got an automatic gearbox or an automated manual, if you're one of those internet people. Thirdly, it is a convertible from an era when a carbon fiber monocoque was something you'd find in the Ann Summers Advanced Engineering Catalog. And fourthly, worst of all, it's not red, like the faces of those angry men on Twitter. But as usual, I think the internet is full of people that wouldn't know fun if it did skids on their driveway. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the least desirable Ferrari from the 1990s, go for a drive and find out if it's actually fun. Hint, it is. Very quick bit of history, the 355 came out in 1994 to replace the very similar 348, but this was designed to be less of a pain in the culo around town. So it got power steering, it got electrically adjustable dampers, so there's a comfort mode and a sport mode, which was very exciting stuff for 1999. At the time, the 355 looked as wide and leery as any other mid-engine supercar, but by modern standards, well, it's 25 centimeters shorter than the current Porsche 911, and it's only 1.9 meters wide, so it shouldn't feel intimidating to actually use. Most importantly, Ferrari stroked the 348's V8 out to 3.5 litres, taking power up to 380 horsepower. At 8,250 RPM and torque went up to 363 newton metres. Performance figures for the time were great. 0 to 62 mile an hour came up in 4.7 seconds, 100 miles an hour in 10.8 seconds, and obviously a modern Volkswagen Golf R would do the same numbers and would keep up with this. However, this would obviously sound a lot better. The top speed is quite an interesting thing. Ferrari quoted 183 miles an hour without a rev limiter. If you were, you know, a normal customer who bought a car, you would have a rev limiter and your car would only do 170 miles an hour, missing out on 13 mystical miles an hour. Oh, Ferrari, please never change. The interior of the 355 is obviously very much a product of the 1990s, and I distinctly remember human thigh masters Zenio on the top chasing Pierce Brosnan in Goldeneye one of these and somehow barely keeping up with his clapped out 30 year old Aston Martin. But anyway, we should talk about the F1 gearbox. It's apparently derived from Ferrari's 1989 Formula One car. So you've got paddles here, you've got a little T bar for reverse down here. And reviews at the time of this car said it's a bit clunky and dim witted, but we will find out on the road bit of this review. And it also had uh, Ferrari's first ever electrically operated convertible roof. And it works just like a modern convertible roof. Dead easy, you just lock it up here and fold the sun visors down and do all of that. But anyway, that's enough waffle about the interior of this. Let's trundle quietly out of town, he says, and find out if this is any good in 2022. Right, let's go for a drive in the Ferrari 355 Spider. You put a key in and turn it, and then you want to check it's in neutral by pulling both paddles, and it says end there. And then it fires into life with a lovely mellifluous bellow from that V8. And then it's a case of pulling back on the right paddle. It takes a second to go into first, and then off you go. Now, first thing you really notice about this is it has got a classic Ferrari driving position. The wheel is kind of in my face. It adjusts up and down though, but not in and out. And I'm six foot three, so I do fit reasonably well, but I'm slightly man-spreading, as it were. The gearbox doesn't creep, but the throttle's got a really natural response, so it's really easy to pull away and drive slowly, which is exactly the whole point of this car when it came out, right? Let's put the windows up using the switches here. And I have to say, this car has only got 24,000 miles on it and it feels almost new inside. There's none of the sticky plastics you sometimes get on cars of this era. 
And now I'm heading out into London traffic in it. Right, this bit's gonna be boring, bimbling out of London. First to second, that was surprisingly smooth. I did lift, you do have to lift a little bit if you want really smooth, low speed gear changes. We'll find out if that gearbox smooths out at faster speeds when we get to faster roads. Can't really do 70 through central London. Right, I finally got out of London traffic and onto a bit of a motorway. And the thing that has impressed me the most about this car so far, other than the engine noise, which we'll get onto, is how well I'm cocooned in here. I'm six foot three, I'm a lanky git. And I've been doing 70 miles now with the roof down in the rain. And I've not been getting wet or cold. So um, Ferrari, you probably didn't put this in a wind tunnel. Maybe you did, I don't know. Um, but you did a good job, maybe by fluke, of protecting me from the elements. Right, we're about to get to fun twisty roads where I can unleash a little bit more of that V8 noise and I'm very excited about doing that. If I can find an accelerator pedal, which is somewhere over by my right nipple. It's really far over. Now, can I tell a difference between the suspension in sport mode and comfort mode? I'm in comfort mode, normal mode, let's put it in sport. Sport lights up on the dashboard. Yeah, there's actually, let's see. Oh yes, there's noticeably firmer, should I say crashier, over potholes, um, but you know, that's what sport means, isn't it? In the 1990s, it means your spine is suddenly filled with lead. I'm gonna put it back. I should also point out that by default you have to use the paddles to change gear and it's actually just quite nice driving like that. It kind of forces you to engage with the car rather than modern cars where they're just autoed by default. This one you have to ask for automatic if you specifically want it. I think that's Ferrari's way of admitting auto mode is a little bit rubbish. Might as well just use the gear paddles and do it yourself. The steering is quite heavy and the rack feels quite slow. I wouldn't have wanted to have the unassisted rack on this. Not really sure why they did that as an option. Maybe it was because the unassisted one had better steering feel, but this feels worlds away from modern Ferraris. I can actually feel stuff through it and it is not lightning quick. So I'm not ending up in hedges inadvertently at the slightest whip of a bend. It just feels very natural with this. My left leg has gone slightly to sleep because it's bent around the steering wheel because there isn't much space for your left foot. There's a little tiny footrest uh, but the steering wheel is kind of in the way of everything. And I'm just probably too tall for this. But anyway. Right, country roads, let's go. That noise is very, very silly. <laughs> Eight and a half thousand RPM red line. I mean, yeah, it doesn't take your face off with performance. It's just a very smooth, linear pull. Oh my, that noise. People of the internet who whinge about this car. They've not heard that. And yes, admittedly, this one does have an aftermarket exhaust on it, but it's not annoying at low speeds, but suddenly there are banshees above three and a half thousand RPM. <laughs> what a thing. Yeah. Over bumps is a little bit jiggly in that old school convertible sort of way, but what do you expect? I'm still driving a convertible V8 Ferrari that has no turbochargers, has proper steering. The gearbox, actually surprisingly brilliant, but most of all, that engine is just an instrument. That sounds more like Ferrari's modern day V12s. That's insane, except I'm not going a million miles an hour and having scary spikes of wheel spin. I like this. I like this a lot. It's an everyday thing that you can actually use on modern public roads. Well, this is great. This is absolutely great. It hasn't got any of those old school anachronisms that make it hard to use. It's just old enough and it's just modern enough. It's right in that perfect little butter zone of lovely Ferrari-ness. What a cool, cool thing. <laughs> That's ridiculous. 
<laughs> the last time I drove a car that was so wantonly stupid sounding as this, I just ran over a child, was the V6 Exige, and that's dead now, so that's going to be a classic soon. the brakes are just about there they are not modern feeling brakes they're numb at the pedal and they they slow you down enough but they're not going to encourage you to drive this really quickly other downside to downshifts it doesn't blip like a modern dual clutch you have to blip yourself if you want blips on your downshifts and upshifts aren't very quick either so yeah the f1 gearbox is not bad but the manual is going to give you more instant gratification. But still, I wouldn't turn down an F1 equipped car at all because the vibe of this car is slightly more relaxed than modern sports cars. It's slightly more get it in a straight line and make it howl than carry huge corner speeds, keep both hands on the wheel. So I wouldn't really worry about that. I would save some money, get an F1 one and stick a stupid exhaust on it <laughs> and remember to brake a bit earlier. Than you think <laughs> my flabber is ghasted what a wicked car <laughs> right back to you tim for an outro so should you write off a left-hand drive f1 gearbox convertible ferrari 355 as the least desirable ferrari of the 1990s no no you shouldn't what an event of a car it's just fast enough it makes the most ridiculous howl thanks to that capristo exhaust and it's just a lovely, lovely event to kind of immerse yourself in. I mean, sure, the gearbox is a bit slow, dim-witted by modern standards, and the chassis is a little bit roly-poly, but it just puts you in a different frame of mind to modern supercars. And frankly, I would save you money if you're after one of these and get the convertible, get the F1 gearbox, and just go out and cruise around like you're a budget Xenia on a top. And Goldeneye was the best film of the 1990s, and I'm slowly convincing myself that this is actually one of the best Ferraris of the 1990s. And I'm sorry, internet people, you are wrong. You've just watched a film on a car and you want to make it yours, here's how you do it. First of all, sign up for a shooting break account. We'll ask you for a credit card to prove that you're a grown up, I guess, and that's about it. Then you just head over to the auction for the car and tell us how much you want to pay. If anyone tries to snipe you at the last moment, two minutes will be added to the end of the auction. You'll be told that you've been outbid so you can get back in there and outbid them. That's just to keep it fair for everyone, the buyers and the seller. If you've posted the highest bid, then after a small but dignified celebration, we'll send you and the seller each other's details. You have 24 hours to sort out fee transfer and vehicle collection, and then it's over to you. Happy bidding.